morning. We are in a series entitled, uh, Dear Church, You've Got Mail. And the, the mail that we're talking about is the seven letters to the churches in Asia in the book of Revelation. These letters were a part of the apocalyptic book in scriptures called Revelation. And just so you understand, these letters were very personal letters. Most of them, most of us in the room probably don't identify with letters as much as maybe we used to. Um, if you are part of today's social media culture, um, letters really aren't like what we see in social media at all. In fact, uh, you could make a case that our obsession with social media messaging has really helped ensure a lot of things, one of them being the end of good writing skills. Just saying, for all the teachers in the house, everybody said... Yeah, so, you know, um, in fact, uh, uh, kind of like a, a malignant disease that's eroding good punctuation, good syntax, um, spelling, grammar, punctuation. Really, um, those who've never been without social media, you really don't know what you're missing if you've never experienced what it's like to wait on a letter. Because here's the deal, you couldn't wait because it, it might be coming in two weeks, but you just couldn't wait and you had to talk to the mailman every single day. Um, you stalk the mailman waiting for him to, hey, do I, have a mail, do I have mail today? Not today. Not today. Nothing today, Tony, especially if you were expecting something. How many of you have ever been expecting a letter in the mail and you could not wait for that to come? And so um, today, most of us, we might experience a thank you note here or there, uh, but there was nothing like receiving a personal letter from someone you love. Uh, some of you experienced, maybe you've experienced that with a family in the military, uh, maybe you've experienced uh, someone who's lived across the country and maybe you pen palled for a while or, or maybe you and your, your love were se separated by time and space for some time. That art has really been lost in our culture. Uh, I, I, share that, I share all of that to say this. I think that these, when we start looking at these seven letters in Revelation, they are pretty close to what it is that I'm describing this morning. They were personal letters. They were written with blood, sweat, tears. I mean, they were written to and from people who would die for each other. I mean, and they actually did just that. They did die for one another. And I'll share one of those stories a little bit later, but if you go to Revelation chapter 2, look at, with, look at it with me in verse 8. Here we go. Revelation 2, 8 says this. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. Verse 9, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Verse 10, Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Each, listen this morning, e each of these seven letters is addressed to a unique church. In this particular case, we're talking about the church in Smyrna. And that is not insignificant by any means, but instead of focusing on this morning, who it's for, who, who the church of Smyrna was, I, I want to focus on this morning, just for a moment, who it's from. Because almost like a, a jigsaw puzzle with seven pieces, these letters are a composite picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, the letter to the church in Ephesus says that he is the one who walks among the seven lampstands. I mean, to the church of Philadelphia, we'll look at these uh, later, later in this series, but to the church of Philadelphia, he's the one who holds the key of David. Uh, to the church in Laodicea, he's the amen, he's the faithful, and he's the true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I, I, I love that, by the way. I love that be, he's the beginning of God's new creation, and I'll talk more about that in week seven, but let me zoom in. On verse 8, it says this, These are the words of him who is the first and the last. 
depending on your translation, some of your translations say the Alpha and the Omega. How many of your, your Bibles say Alpha, Omega? How many of you have your Bible open? Okay, maybe you should do that. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to scold them for listening today. They're listening quite well, but they're not opening their Bibles because we got this big old screen right here. So anyway, how many, how many of you have ever read this passage of Scripture and said Alpha, Omega? How many of you have ever read this, scrap, uh, this passage of Scripture and it said uh, the beginning and the end? Okay, I mean, the, the, uh, it's very, very important that you understand that there is something that this writer is trying to communicate to these people about who God is. In fact, uh, can, I, I just want to stop right here for a second because it's important. Uh, uh, these are the words of him who was the first and the last, who died but came back to life again. I, I just, I got to stop for a second because sometimes we just keep on reading, don't we? When we're looking at uh, passages, of like, passages of scripture like this, we're kind of wanting to know, I want to know what the seven fiery dragons are that come up out of the abyss. That's what I'm interested in, Pastor Tony. And then we skip right over this passage. So, but, but do we get this? I, I, I don't know that we do sometimes. This is some serious authority at the beginning of, in the end here. I mean, do, do you realize who it is that we're actually talking about? Do you realize who it is that we're speaking of here when John says, the writer of this says, these are the words of him who is the first and he's the last. He is our cosmology. He's our account of the universe, its, its origins. I mean, he is our eschatology. He is our end. He is our uh, our ending as well. And so he's also, listen, he says he's also the one who died and rose again. Listen, when, when Jesus, i, I got to say this because I, it's not just for Easter Sunday that we say this, but it, when Jesus walked out of that tomb on the third day, let me just tell you all bets were off. I mean, all things are possible now for those who, to, who believe. Uh, I went to a Kansas City Royals game uh, back in 1999, and, and that wasn't the last time I went to one, but I remember this one specifically. That day they were there uh, playing the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, uh, Terry and I had pretty much a front row seat, uh, seven rows back from the dugout, uh, to all the players from the St. Louis Cardinals. And I don't know if you remember this, but I, I know what you're thinking, boo, St. Louis Cardinals, boo. And, and while I agree to that sentiment somewhat, um, that day I didn't really care. I didn't care at all. Even though there were some stars that were on that team, I wasn't there to see anybody else that day. I wasn't even really there to see Mike Sweeney. I wasn't there to see Carlos Beltran. I wasn't even there to see Ray Sanchez, who played for the Royals. I was there to see one player and one player alone, and his name was Mark McGuire. Because I had heard that he was huge. And I wanted to get close enough to find out if he really was. He has arms the size of some people's waists. I'm just saying. The year before, he had hit 70 home runs in one season, and the legend was true. He came out of the dugout. I don't know which bat he was. I think he was fourth. That's usually where the lineup, they, they put you in the lineup if you're like a, a home run crush hitter. But he did. He had arms the size of people's waists. And he came out of the dugout like, how many of you have ever read that little story when you were in school called Casey at Bat? <laughs> he came out just like Casey at Bat. I mean, this guy was huge. I mean, after that, the, the outlook wasn't really all that br brilliant for the KC9 that day, but, but Casey did end up winning the game. But he was the real deal. I mean, even though later we found out he had steroids and was involved in all that. But anyway, <sighs> Just, just saying, even more so, let me just say this, because you cannot argue with him who died and rose again. You can't argue with him who died and rose again. He is the beginning and the end. Do you understand what the, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth right now? He's the beginning and he's the ending. These words pack such an incredible punch. I mean, the power of prayer, it's not the words we choose. 
The power of prayer is not the fact that you can pray eloquently up here on Wednesday night. The power of prayer is the God that we actually pray to has the ability to answer the prayers that you're actually praying up. So we're praying to him who is the first and he's the last. We are praying to him who died and who rose again. We are, sometimes we forget. We forget who it is that we're praying to. And that's what happens when we have impotent prayers. I mean, it's like, you know, we forget who it is that actually is making things happen. So, but when we remember who we're praying to, we pray in, in, with bold humility or with humil- <laughs> humble boldness, if you will. Y- you take your pick. But at some point, You've got to stop talking to God about your problems and start talking to your problems about God. I'm telling you because God is that big. He's that great. So now, just so we understand, when we're reading down through this passage, there are more than 400 names in Scripture for God in the Bible, and each one reveals a different dimension of who He is. He's, he's I mean, we can think of the places in, in Scripture that we all kind of rem- memorize, and He's wonderful, He's counselor, He's mighty God, He's Prince of Peace, He's everlasting Father. Uh, he is Father, He's Son, and He's Holy Spirit. He is the way, the truth, and the... So, but but I, I rather like this catch-all name here. Check this out. He's the Alpha and he's the Omega. I want to make sure we understand that, but let me go back to the book of Exodus just for a second because there's this moment where God reveals his identity. And he does so in a, in a very rather curious, a curious way to a man named Moses at a burning bush. And when Moses asks his name, God says, I am. Now, think about this for a second. When was the last time when you introduced yourself that way? I mean, think about it. I mean, because I think people are waiting for what's next. Hi, I am. You are what? (laughs) Who are you? (laughs) In fact, it's almost like God leaves this unresolved chord, uh, or maybe the unanswered question, if you will, this unfinished painting, I am. And then you go to the Gospels in the New Testament, and the Gospel of John, and Jesus begins to answer this question, and I want you to see it. He says, I am, and we have these seven statements. I preached on it a few years back. I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the door. I'm the vine. I'm the good shepherd. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Life, we see that Jesus answering the questions of who he really is. You know, it begins to fill in the blank, and then you get to this last book of the Bible, and it's like God fills in the blank one more time, saying, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And just so you understand completely, here's what God is saying Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Okay, great. You're A to Z. I mean, I've heard songs on it, Tony. That's, that's really funny. That's really great. So, so what God is saying is, listen to me. I am, I am the alphabet. I am the alphabet. Now, before Before you can completely understand this, I want you to think about this for just a second. Think about this uh, in context. Let's take the Emporia Library. Okay? I mean, lots of books in the Emporia Library, right? I mean, or or take even larger libraries. Let's just take Emporia State's Library just for a second. Very large library, lots of books, right? Now think even bigger. Think of this. There's said to be in our nation's capital, 35 million books in the Library of Congress in our nation's capital. Now, just so you understand, every single one of these books in every single library across our nation, all across the United States, only use 26 letters. And yet these books... They're vastly different. I mean, they're, they're as different as if I say two different doctors. How many of you, if I said doctor, and what are you expecting me to say next? Dr. Phil? But what if I wanted to say Dr. Seuss? I, I'm just saying, 
How many of you would agree that those two books are kind of on polar opposite ends? And so, (laughs) without the alphabet, none of these books exist. But with the alphabet, it's endless possibilities. Everything from the Magna Carta to the Constitution to the Bible itself. It's like God is saying, I am the alphabet. He's esta- Listen to me. He's establishing his authority. How much, how comprehensive is our God? He's so big that there's nothing written outside of time or space that actually doesn't include the fact, the very fact that he is and the knowledge that he has to actually be able to, to make people be able to learn the alphabet. I mean, he's, he's establishing his authority. Not just, listen, not just cosmologically or, or eschatolog- eschatologically, but his authority right down to the jot and the t- tittle, to the, to the dotting of the I and the crossing of the T's to the last letter in the alphabet. And so listen, yes, it's, it's for the church in Smyrna, but I'm more convinced about who it's from, from the first and the last, him who died, and then he rose again. And so... Look at verse 9. He says this. I know you're suffering. I know you're poverty. Yet you're rich. What what an interesting juxtaposition here uh, that he says to the church in Smyrna. And and just so you completely understand, this letter really is addressing a couple of different things that we face, maybe in different degrees at different times. Now, as Americans, most of us in the room, you're probably in the 85th percentile as far as the world is concerned, as far as wealth. I mean, you are are up there. Uh, You're you're in the upper crust of the 15% of people that can afford to actually do things outside of just eat. And have and then have sometimes have clothes and shelter. Some of you are looking at me like, you apparently don't understand how much money I don't have, Pastor Tony. I'm just telling you, you are rich when you compare yourself to the rest of the world. Right. That's all there is to it. I mean, we we are we're, we're the richest nation on earth, and so th- this letter is addressing things to these people, and really a couple of things are being addressed here. First one is this: is suffering. The second then thing that they're they're actually being addressed with is the fact that they are living in poverty and and listen suffering goes without saying last weekend we talked about the emperor domitian we know he was crazy and they hunted christians like wild game and and when they caught when they would catch them they put these christians into these coliseums for blood sport and and there was tremendous suffering and, and they were poor and let me just tell you i want you to understand something when we say someone's poor Let me help you understand how it is that these people are poor. When they made their profession of faith, it would have disqualified them from being being able to go to any trading or any guilds that they could actually go and buy and sell. The moment that they identified as Christian, it was occupational suicide. For the Smyrnans. When they professed their faith in Christ, they were taking a vow of poverty. And so they were persecuted and they were poor. But it says, yet you are rich. I know people who are materially rich and spiritually poor. And we call them rich we like to we like to we like to study them. We have we have and I know this is an older show but you know we have lifestyles of the rich and famous, right? I mean, we, we love to see, how many of you have ever watched that show with the RVs, the million dollar RVs? Anybody seen that show? Or have, how many of you have seen some of the shows where they're taking cars and they go out and they find a rare car and then they take it and they fix it up and then they, they actually sell it and turn around and then the guy starts out with like, okay, uh, that'll be, uh, well, let's just start out with $120,000. And you're like going, what? $120,000 car? Are you crazy? I mean, my house isn't even like that, you know, so, you know, uh, so, so, so listen, there are people out there that we call rich, but we know better scripturally. And I know people who are materially poor and spiritually rich, and we call them poor. And I wonder if our culture doesn't have it backwards. I mean, I don't wonder, I know they have it backwards. I mean, one guy said it this way, the world measures success by how much you make and how many people serve you. He said, but God measures success by how much you give and how many people ser- uh, you serve. It's right side up. 
Now let me just get practical for a second because I wonder if some of us maybe in a different form of fashion uh, are experiencing some of the suffering or, or maybe some of the poverty that's talked about uh, in this passage. And I, and I want to help us. There's, there's something in psychology that's called a downward cou- counterfactual. And simply put, it's comparing your current situation, no matter how bad it might be, with somebody who has it worse. I mean, that is a downward counterfactual. Now, in upward counterfactual, it does the exact opposite. It's comparing your situation with a situation that's actually better, and it has depressing effects. And so I think if we're focused on what we want instead of what we have, because how many of you can agree that sometimes I can get you in trouble? <laughs> you guys are all going... I'm not watching TV. I'm going to actually answer the question that he just asked because I don't think that was rhetorical. It wasn't. I wanted you to answer me. How many of you would agree with that? Okay, good, 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 good. Listen, joy is not getting what you want. Joy is is appreciating what you have. And I think sometimes we get to a we 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 got to we got to get a reality check. In fact, one of the great things about our missions trips that we've taken and gone on a lot of the times is the fact that they are reality checks. I mean, many of our problems are are first world problems, and and it's really quite sad when we step back and say what we think we don't have, and then we go see somebody that has so much less than that, but yet they worship the same God, and they're just as happy as you are, and they are worshiping the Lord right in the middle of a church with a dusty floor, and they didn't have anybody clean it that week, and no one's complaining about, well, the toilet won't flush, and because they don't even have a toilet, and so, I mean, I'm just saying, like, it, it, it's really crazy sometimes what it is that we think we've got to have. The downward counterfactual and the upward counterfactual are why studies show that a bronze medalist is happier than a silver medalist. You may say, what? Yeah. Now that doesn't make any sense because the silver medalist beat the bronze medalist, I know. But Vicki Medivac, she she did a, a a fascinating study and found that the reason is pretty simple. Silver medalists, what they're focused on is they're focused on how close they came to getting the gold. And so they're disappointed. Bronze medalists, what they do is they focus on how close they came to not getting a medal at all. And they're grateful that they are actually even able to be on the podium. And so, listen, I think this is more than just some si- some type of Jedi mind trick, you know. I think this is Philippians 4.8. If anything is good, if anything is right, if anything is pure, well, think on these type of things. I mean, we, we cannot control our experiences, I understand, but, but explanations, our perceptions, and standing on the promises of God change the way we engage the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And, and I'll be honest, I think these letters really are more about his church having a certain mindset. It's almost like Jesus is getting the church ready because he knows there's going to be some persecution come Smyrna's way. And I think sometimes we've got to brace ourselves for some of these difficult seasons that we go through in life. How many of you would just be honest right now and you'd say, hey, Tony, in the last year I've gone through a difficult season in my life. Raise your hand. I mean, stuff happens. Things happen in our lives. I want you to look at verse 10. It says this, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. By the way, 10 days, it's, it's, it's literally a, a, a bit of a mystery, uh, mysterious reference, really, but it's a, a, a number of completion in Scripture. And so the idea here is that there will be a season of suffering, but it will, it will come to full term. In other words, this too shall pass in your life as a Christ follower. I think it's so important. Ecclesiastes 3, we can look at that and say to understand that there is a time for laughter, there is a time for crying, there is a time for building up, there is a time uh, for tearing down. The beautiful thing at the end of this though, and again, you got to know what season you're in, is, is that it says God makes everything beautiful in its time but we've got to understand the season that we're in and so he says be faithful even to the point of death 
Oh, by the word, by the way, be faithful even to the point of death. These words weren't just talk. These were prophetic words. In fact, 155 AD, Roman bounty hunters tracked down the pastor of Smyrna. They called him the Bishop of Smyrna, a man by the name of Polycarp. Polycarp did not run when they came tracking him. He did not hide. He actually, here's what he did. He actually welcomed them into his house, and he actually fed them dinner. But he made one request. If you're going to eat my food and you're going to hang out in my house, I get to pray over you for an hour. And he actually prayed for two hours. And it's said by the end of that prayer, some of these bounty hunters had put their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, that didn't keep some of those same bounty hunters from binding his hands, dragging him into the Colosseum in Smyrna. And the Roman proconsul together uh, told him to recant his faith and he would spare his life. Polycarp said the following. I want you to see it. It says this. 86 years have I served him, and he's done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? I don't know about you. Those are convicting words. Because I think we'll do a lot as Americans just to get to eat or just to get to do what our flesh wants us to do, which is, well, as long as I get to go home and chill in my relaxing chair, I'm good. But when the die was cast, Polycarp had said these words. The crowd began to chant in the Colosseum, Let loose the lion! Let loose the lion! Let loose the lion. And then those who were in the Colosseum that day heard a voice, a voice from heaven, and the voice said this, Be strong, Polycarp. Play the man. And that's what Polycarp did. He showed what it was like to be a real man. And the Roman council chose death by fire, but as the fire was lit, Polycarp prayed this prayer. I want you to see it. I give you thanks that you count me worthy to be numbered among your martyrs. Second Christian, second century Christian author and theologian Tertullian said this, the blood of the martyrs is like the seed of the church. I think we want to skip over these pieces of the story and but but when I but when we when we do skip over these 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 parts that we're reading right now, I don't think that we appreciate what it is that we actually have. I mean, now, th- this, is, this is where the plot thickens, I'm just telling you, because according to tradition, Polycarp, listen to this, was discipled by none other than John the Beloved. When John wrote this letter to the church, and by the way, who's the writer of Revelation? John. So when... John is writing these letters to the church in Smyrna. Polycarp didn't read, just read this letter. How many of you have ever read a a letter and you actually heard the person's voice that you're reading the letter from and you can hear them talking? And I don't pretend to know what was going through his mind and he was being, as he was being tortured. This is many years after this letter was written, but I can't help but wonder if John's words in this letter are what gave him the strength to endure to the end, be faithful even to the point of death. Polycarp, pastor of Smyrna, the 12th martyr of Smyrna, did just that. This is a picture I want you to see. This is a very famous picture John Olson's famous photo of wounded Marines being evacuated during the Battle of Hue in February 1968, the Battle of Vietnam. They were fighting in Hue City, Vietnam. They had breached the city's historic citadel, but radio communications were out, and so from, out, from front-line positions, Marines 
they would run back a block or two to give updates and then receive orders of what they were to do next. And so in this scene, one of the platoons is helping a gravely wounded and unconscious fighter into the front of a tank. The stretcher is a wooden door. And the tank stops to pick this guy up and two other Marines. And so my understanding was that the soldier's name was a debate between two different guys. One guy's name was Alvin and the other guy's name was James. And they were trying to figure out who it was because they couldn't make out who the person was and so who, who was shot in the chest. And then fellow Marines tried to seal it with cellophane from um, cigarette packages. And, and he ended up being saved. But this picture really kind of gives you the idea of what it is like, what, what, what price there is for freedom. And I mean, I, 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 another more unknown story was a guy who served in Vietnam and he took some bullets during battle and, and when they were extracted, the shrapnel and the bullets that came out of this guy, he put them in a bottle. As he put them in the bottle whenever he would run into someone who was feeling ungrateful or complaining about life circumstances. He would take out this bottle and he would just shake it. Ching, 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 ching. Ching, 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 ching. And, and, and he would say, this is the price of freedom. Ching, 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 ching. I think what this letter, when we look at this letter to Smyrna does, it kind of just shakes the bottle a little bit. There's so many, think about this, who have sacrificed so much so that you and I can enjoy the blessings that we have. And before we make this about one of those blessings in America, go America! Woo! I can continue drinking my beer and watching my football. I mean, I'm just... It's quiet in here, isn't it? When you tell stories like this, and you talk about what Christianity is really like, and then we talk about the American version of that, isn't it sad? I'm, I'm, I'm just saying because this is the price. There's so many people who have sacrificed so much that we can enjoy the blessings that we have. And I asked it last week, but I ask it again. What have you sacrificed in your relationship with Jesus Christ? I mean, I think many of us follow Jesus right up to the point where it's convenient but we don't want to go any further than that because if convenience is out the window, then I'm kind of out the window. I don't really want to do that. Then I'm, I, I, don't, I, I ain't got time for that. I ain't got time to follow Jesus like that. Philippians 3.10, it even says it, but not like we mean it. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Yeah! Woo! That's what I want. I want Jesus' power. Don't you love that? It's a, it's a great sermon to preach, and some of you are like, come on, go ahead and preach it that way. But, you know, don't you want that? I mean, don't you want God's power? Like, I want to experience that resurrection power, but it doesn't end there. In fact, it's a two-sided coin. Paul continues, and he says this, I want to suffer with him. <gasps> Wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on. Sharing in his, it's getting worse. Sharing in his death? Uh, it's so easy to read that. And concentrate on his power and read all of that. But then get to that last part and it's like, what? Because it really pushes the envelope. In fact, just so you get that Jesus is not just making the point that I'm making this morning. He's actually driving this point home even so much more than you have any idea. Because if we actually look at the town of Smyrna, Smyrna... The name Smyrna has roots in suffering. Smyrna is a very interesting word because the Greek word is translated as myrrh. And you might be like, okay, what's the big deal about that? It's a substance taken from a thorny balsam or a herb tree, or, or herb tree, and it was used in ancient times as perfume, holy ointment, and even to uh, people in pagan ceremonial riches, uh, uh, rituals. But it's, its use in the New Testament, it's used in three different places in Scripture. The first one, we all know it, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? Jesus' birth, right? Matthew 2.11. The second place was used, it was used at Jesus' crucifixion. The third place was at John's, or excuse me, at Jesus' burial. Myrrh was present in all three of these in Scripture. And Christ's life, his death, and his burial can be summed up in one word, and that is 
suffering. Myrrh provides a beautiful picture of suffering. One interesting fact about myrrh is the fact that it actually has to be crushed before it gives forth any fragrance. The more it's crushed, the more fragrant it becomes. The same was true of the church in Smyrna. The more the people were crushed, the sweeter the aroma. The more they were stomped on, the more they were alienated, the more they were pushed out, the more the world caught the fragrance of their faith and their love for one another. The crushed church is the fragrant church. So history says when they were, when they were slandered, they weren't just called names or made fun of like we tend to experience in American culture. So when these Christians spoke of partaking in the body and blood of Jesus Christ, they were accused of things like cannibalism. Because they were hated so bad, they would just find any excuse they could find just to make sure that they were all able to die because we just need to get rid of these people. And when they had church dinners, what, was, what were called love feasts, and I know that that might mean something completely different to you, but when we get together and we fellowship as a family, there's love present, is there not? I mean, when we, when we spend time at the Anderson Building in a few weeks and, and we're, we're having a Thanksgiving meal together, I mean, in, in what Jesus is love, what binds us all together? This was the, the first church. They were, they were serious about this. They wanted to have these times where they were together and they were accused and they were charged that with immorality that would happen at orgies they were being accused of that because they did not accept the greek gods they were actually accused of something so crazy they were accused of atheism which it was illegal to be an atheist in the roman culture and so because they spoke so much about the fire of the spirit and the the fires of divine judgment they were accused of being arsonists and incendiaries I mean, in addition to that, their unwillingness to pay homage to Caesar as being Lord earned them the accusation of disloyalty to Rome, and so that was a punishable that would be death. And so the intense loyalty they tended to demonstrate toward one another and toward Christ once they had embraced Christianity and the fact that particularly Jewish families would often virtually disown those who had become Christians were sufficient to have them charged with the splitting of families. And so if you wanted to contrast the church in Smyrna with the church in Ephesus, there was no comparison. I mean, Ephesus had no persecution, no particular problems from persecution, but what did they have? What did they lose? Ephesus lost its first love. And they left their first love because they began to rely on the very things that I see as a pastor in our culture American Christians starting to rely upon, and that's this, shiny things. There's so many shiny things. There's so many little things that we think that we have to have, but the church in Smyrna didn't. When they were persecuted, they ran to Jesus. The more the world hated them, the more they were crushed, the more they loved Jesus, the more the world stomped on them, the more they leaned on Jesus Christ. The little church of Smyrna was being crushed, and the crushed were fragrant. Sarah and the team come back. Why were they being crushed? One, they wouldn't sprinkle incense in a flame before a bust of Caesar. That's why. That's reason number one. The Roman Empire had imp- emperor wor- worship, and Smyrna, like we talked about last week, we, was a, f- a center for this, and imp- emperor worship became an offshoot of what was originally the worship of Rome, and the Christians in Smyrna lived in a culture where Caesar was a god to the people, and, and, and so not doing what the other Smyrnians were doing was like being looked upon disfavorably. The results were they were accused of a lack of patriotism. The entire city boycotted them. Why else were they being accused, or excuse me, crushed? They didn't fit into their society. Isn't it funny? Christians in America are so busy, trying. many Christians in America, the church in America really, is so busy trying to look like the world that we forget what it is that we're actually doing. 
I'm just saying because some of you would be like, you know, well, you know, uh, there, there, there's, a, there's a part of us to, uh, that we've got to be in the world and we've got to understand it, we've got we to work with it, we've got to deal with it. And, and, and listen, Christians didn't participate in these paganistic rituals. They didn't approve of so many different things. Emporia has lamps downtown. Why do we have lamps downtown? Well, we have them so we can see at night, right? I mean, that's why we have them. Well, uh, Smyrna had pagan idols along every single street everywhere. It was truly the grossest immorality, uh, idolatry that you can actually possibly imagine. And they didn't fit in. The Christians didn't fit in there. Three, if it's one thing to be hated by people who have no idea, <laughs> but it's also another thing to be hated by people who are kind of closely connected. Certain Jews hated them. Look at Revelation 2, 9. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Notice what Christ calls these particular Jews, the synagogue of Satan. Can I just tell you this? If your life, I don't care how religious you look. I don't care how religious these Jews looked. Without Christ, there is a major problem. Most Jews rejected Jesus. And here, here's what the scripture says. If you're not for him, what does it say? You're against him. And it's ironic because the same place that used to belong to the Lord now belonged to Satan. And those who belonged to that synagogue hated the Christians so much that they slandered them. And so they joined with the rest of Smyrna in putting them to death. And this was why Smyrna's pastor, Polycarp, was killed. Listen. The crown of life is the martyr's crown for the one who dies for Jesus Christ. And the promise is this. The one who is victorious will not be hurt by the second death. As the team begins to play this morning, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning if we could. Lots of... Uh, distraction happening all over the place this morning this morning bowing our heads and closing our eyes is just something that we do so that we can actually get alone with the Lord I know in a room this size it's hard to be alone with God but in this moment as the team is playing as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed here is the final word to the unsafe person or even the person who wants to play around and pretend to be a Christian if this is you scripture says that you're in danger of the second death the second death is the one the Smyrnans didn't have to fear they only had to endure the first death the, the persecution that was in the here and the now but the second death is the one that Jesus said you should respect. And how are you going to overcome an eternal death in hell without God? That is not a popular thing to say in our culture. But if we want to follow the Bible and if we're going to be a Christian, we're going to follow all the word of God. And the Bible does very clearly in Scripture talk about a place called hell. And it's a place where it's the absence of God. How are you going to overcome your own sin? How are you going, how are you going to overcome Satan himself? How are you going to overcome the world? There's only one way. And that's by believing in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's Christ's message to you this morning. Maybe you're here and, and you, you don't know the source of the book of, the Re of Revelation. His name is Jesus Christ. This book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And our God, He longs to be gracious with you. To give you a way past your sin. To give you a way out the bridge over your sin is God's grace. 
this morning, even more than that, he wants to free you from your sin. There's a way that seems right to a person, but in the end, the scripture says it's death. And Jesus is that bridge over your sin and over that ultimate death. And this morning, God is drawing you to himself, and you realize you're far from him, and you also realize that you can't save yourself. Jesus, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father unless it's through him. So you're here this morning. The Holy Spirit is speaking in your heart and you recognize your need for salvation this morning right where you're at. Heads bowed, eyes closed. This is not a show. That's not what this is at all, but it is something to wear. We want to help you see your need for God this morning. You're here and you'd say, I need Jesus Christ to be the Savior and the Lord of my life. He's not the Savior and the Lord of my life today.